Hello everyone, welcome to the February WinUI community call. Um, I'm Anna, I'm a PM on the WinUI team. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this morning, afternoon, whatever time it is where you are. Um, we have a great call planned for you all today, so I'm really excited to just get right into things. Um, so a little bit more about the community call. These take place on the third Wednesday of every month at 1700 UTC, which is 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, the next call will likely be March 17th. Um, in the meantime, you can always keep up with us on GitHub and Twitter. Um, yeah. Uh, so as for today's call agenda, we have the intro, which I'm gonna do as usual. 
I'm going to be talking all about WinUI 3 Preview 4, which if you haven't heard, it was released. Um, Miguel from the WinUI team is going to be doing some really cool Preview 4 demos. Um, and then we have a guest joining us, Morton Nielsen, uh, who will be demoing Esri's ArcGIS running on WinUI 3 Preview 4. Oh my gosh, I have a typo in my PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Morton is just is too fast making these changes. I could not keep up in my PowerPoint, but... That's another preview for a demo that's really cool. Uh, then we're gonna talk a little bit about how you as a community member can maximize your impact on WinUI. And then of course we'll have Q and A as usual. So as for our intro, what is WinUI? WinUI is the native UI platform for Windows 10. It's built for today's modern hardware and devices and it offers the latest fluent styling. You can use WinUI to build rich .NET and C++ apps for Windows 10 devices. Uh, so WinUI actually powers the Windows and Xbox OS shells, and it also powers many apps and other platforms, like Xamarin Forms and React Native for Windows. So WinUI 2 and WinUI 3 are the two generations of WinUI. WinUI 2 is the second generation, um, and it's built for UWP apps. So WinUI 2 consists of the visual layer and the XAML framework in the OS, as well as a library of Fluent-based controls and styles. So this is usually updated about three times a year. Our last release was WinUI 2.5, and we also release pretty frequent pre-releases of WinUI 2. Um, I believe there is a pretty recent WinUI 2.6 pre-release that you can get your hands on if you are interested. Um, moving on to WinUI 3, WinUI 3 is the new third generation of this native UX stack in Windows. Um, it's currently in preview. As I said, we just released preview 4. Um, was it last week? A little bit ago. Um, but it consolidates the UX technologies previously built into Windows into a single decoupled framework. And WinUI 3 is made available for all Windows apps, which means UWP, desktop app. WinUI 3 will work for you. Uh, so... Exciting news, we are introducing WinUI 3 Preview 4 today. Um, this release, I believe, last week. And it's really what we want to serve as a point in time preview. Uh, we wanna show you all the progress that we've made since Preview 3 and um, just continue to allow all of our developers to use the latest bug fixes. I know there were a few critical bugs that really need fixes and it sucks to wait. Um, and just all the new uh, you know, little capabilities and just things that we fixed and added since Preview 3, we wanted to be able, we wanted all of you to be able to get your hands on it. So what's new in Preview 4, we have a, new, a few new capabilities. Um, there's new custom title bar APIs, which Miguel is gonna talk a lot about, so I won't focus too much on that right now. Um, we also now have support for virtual surface image source, if that's something you're using. Uh, and also something that I think is exciting is we have parity with WinUI 2.5. So all the controls and new updates that you're loving using in WinUI 2.5, you can now use in your WinUI 3 apps with Preview 4. Um, so the info bar control, navigation view footer menu, progress ring, um, determinant state, uh, you can use all that in your WinUI 3 app now. As for what's fixed, uh, we fixed a lot of critical bugs in this release. So a big one was that when UI three apps were crashing on insider build that has been fixed. Um, there were a few crash bugs that we fixed uh, in data grid, context flyout, drop down button, and a few more. Um, and we also took in a new uh, C sharp WinRT package that fixed issues with uh, Marshall functions and issues with binding that you may have been experiencing um, as a limitation on preview three. But Overall, we tried to fix a lot of uh, critical bugs that were filed on our GitHub repo this time around. So if your bug was fixed, you should have received some kind of notification on your GitHub issue um, that it's been fixed and a fix is available in Preview 4. So you can get started at aka.ms slash winui3 slash preview4. Here you'll find our release notes, which will give you installation instructions along with new capabilities and also all the known issues and limitations, which, you know, obviously this is a preview. Um, so it's still an early release product. It has some limitations that you may want to read through before you get started. Um, 
A quick thing about WinUI tooling, um, if you are interested, and you should be interested, in using WinUI tooling like Live Property Explorer, Hot Reload, Live Visual Tree, and you're using Visual Studio 16.9 Preview 4, you may need to enable these things. So as the instructions say here, you navigate to Preview Features within Visual Studio, click on Enable UI Debugging Tooling for WinUI 3 Projects, click on OK. That just turns on these preview features. Um, and if you're confused or you need to see these instructions again, there's an issue up on our repo all about this. So if you just search for WinUI tooling on there, you should be able to find it and ask questions if needed. And uh, just something that I wanted to point out this time around, we have a bunch of ecosystem partners that we're working with on WinUI 3. Um, all these you know, technologies listed here are working on enabling WinUI 3 to work with their technology. We have a few control vendors um, and then a few platforms that allow you to bring your app cross-platform, like Uno platform. But we would definitely recommend checking out our ecosystem partners. A lot of times they can provide uh, a bunch of new controls that we might not have yet. Um, things like charts and graphs I know are available in a few of these. Um, and the Windows Community Toolkit is an awesome thing um, that uh, a lot of you may already be using, but that's something that gives you new controls and capabilities as well. Um, and onto this, I also want to give a special shout out to the Windows Community Toolkit and Uno Platform for having day zero support for Preview 4. So as I said, a lot of our ecosystem partners are working on getting WinUI 3 support, um, but Uno and Windows Community Toolkit actually already support Preview 4. So definitely go ahead and check those out. They're awesome. So now we're going to move on to the very exciting Preview 4 demos. Um, Miguel, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, we can get started. Sure, Anna. Yeah, give me a sec. No problem. All right. So here, as Anna said, it's time to have fun. So let's see some coding action. This is a, a .NET 5 WinUI 3 in desktop app. is using the latest BIPs of the preview 4 of WinUI. If you, you are curious, this is the fourth bill of the second of, uh, of the February, 10 of February, that we built. Uh, Two important things I want to talk about that. The first one is you see this target platform uh, mean version. This is the version, the minimum version that support uh, the preview four. So for the next supported version, which is the uh, WinUI 3, which is part of the project reunion 0.5, something that we are going to achieve in, in March. So we are going to up uh, a little this version uh, is going just to support the version uh, 1809, this one over there. So a, a preview four supports 1803, this Reston four, something that we call Reston. Um, for the supported version, Reunion 0.5 is going to be up to this version. Good. Another thing uh, I want to talk about that is yes, remember that we also support ARM64. So something that we ship in the preview of three, but just a reminder. Well, uh, let's talk about the windowing space. Uh, if for the windowing space, we extend uh, several capabilities of the platform. One of them is allowed to the developer can create custom title bar. So we introduced two new APIs. Let me go into my code and show you this couple of API that we introduce. One is the extends content to the title bar, and the another one is set title bar. Extend content uh, remove the system title bar uh, from the from the window and extend the content of some of the content into this title bar area, um, because there is no uh, system title bar. So you lose all this draggable area. You need somehow to specify which uh, 
panel, which UI element is going to be the new draggable area. Uh, so you need to specify as well the set title bar. So when you are using extend content into the title bar, you also are going to require to use set title bars as well. In this example, I'm using a stack panel. The stack panel is the one who is going to be the new title bar. Inside of the stack panel, I am setting up an image. And this image is, um, is, a, is a GIF, if animated GIF, uh, some test block. Just one uh, uh, heads up, a, every control that you put in there is not going to get the input. So it means if you put a button in the title bar, it's not going to click on there. So it has to be only static because all the title bar, all these draggable areas is, uh, is getting the input. So let me run this up. So you see in here, this is my custom title bar. And if you take a look to this icon, you see how this icon is animated, it's, it's moving. So it's, all, it's cool. Actually, this stack panel, it becomes the new title bar. Uh, you, of course, we draw this button for you, so you don't have to do anything. So just extending into the, the content to the title bar, we are going to drop that. Good. Uh, more things. Another interesting point is even you have your own custom title bar, you still need to set up the title of the window. What that means? Means that when you move your cursor over the tax uh, the, of the, the text bar, or although and also you are changing into different windows, so you need somehow to specify the title bar and the icon of this window. So for 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 doing that, just remember that you have a property which is called title in your window. This property. And also, you need to load the, the icon that you are going to use in your window. So the thing is, in the preview four, we didn't implement it yet, yet the icon property, but this is a Win Y3 uh, in desktop, which means a Win32 app, and you can use all the Win32 API that you have today. Uh, in this case, for instance, I'm implementing my own a method who calls the icon I put in the window. Just I'm getting the edge wing of the window and just calling these two Win32 API. In this case, I'm using some kind of pinvoke. So for example, this low image, I'm loading the image into this uh, 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 pointer and this, then using the send message function, Win32 send message function, and just setting the, the icon. So it's not very, complex, it will, it will be much better if we have only one property, but meanwhile, this is in development, you can you can uh, still using these two APIs. And also, that's demonstrated to you that you can call any Win32 API in your Win3 in desktop. More stuff. Mm. All right, so another interesting thing that happens with uh, the preview four is we are, uh, we are uh, remove the dependency that we have in the core window um, and core dispatcher from the Win Y3. Means that in Win Y3, we support two models, UWP and desktop. So the Win Y3 is no longer have a strong dependency in core window and also core dispatcher means the version of the Win32 is going to use the own implementation for having their own dispatcher and also their own implementation with the edge win. So this uh, dependency was completely removed, meaning that in win by preview four, every, every time that you call something with core window is going to return null and everything that uh, every time that you call a core dispatcher or dispatcher is going to return null. As a consequences, you need to uh, use a different APIs that allow to you to do a similar functionality that you have today with core window um, and, and core dispatcher. For instance, one of the things that is a sting development, actually is, is a bug, is when you are running this, this window, uh, you press the shortcut Alt X4, which is you are expecting to close the window, so it's doing nothing. So this uh, this functionality, this shortcut is still is still uh, not done. 
So, but it's very straightforward just to do that. The only thing that you can do it is, for example, just listening the key down event, um, close the window manually, right? So to do that in the past, so you will do something like this. Window current core window, get key state, and you get the, the key, and you are uh, questioning if this uh, key is down or whatever. So, however, as I said before, core window is going to be null. And instead of using this API, you can use the new API core keyboard input. We have a similar method called get key uh, state for current thread. So, and you can, uh, you can ask for any key if you're already down. In this case, it's the all key, which is the, the, the menu, the virtual key uh, enum. And that's it. It's, it is down, just yes, you close the window. So I remember, it's going to be several changes that you have to do in when you migrate it from UWP to the preview three or to the preview four, or even when you migrate from the preview three to the preview four. Uh, I believe that we are creating a, a table where it's going to recommend to you what kind of API you can you can you can use. Uh, Exactly the same thing that I show you in here with the core with the uh, uh, core dispatcher. You have to do exactly the same thing with the core window. So I'm going to show you an example over there about the core uh, dispatcher. So instead of using the core dispatcher, we already introduced something called the dispatcher queue. I believe that was was introduced in the previous one, but now is the moment that you have to move all your code over there. So if you, for example, if you want to uh, update the UI from a different thread, you can do something like that. Just call dispatcher queue. Uh, dispatcher queue is a property that is in every UI element. Um, just uh, do and try uh, in queue and put all your code that is going to be moved to the UI thread, uh, thread in here. And that, that's it, as simple as this one. Mm -hmm. All right, more stuff. Yeah, let me just run again the app in here. So because I want to show you these uh, two buttons over there. So in the preview, uh, I believe it was in the preview one, we introduced the support of the window for desktop. And also we uh, we already supported a window in the same UI3. However, it was very, it was in development. Let's, let's say in this way. And these uh, two feature about creating multiple windows in the same UI thread or, or in separate thread are still in development. Uh, for instance, if you click in this button, you can create a new window, this support multi window. However, there is several bugs that we need to fix before uh, putting this in the uh, supported version. Just for instance, if you move this icon, this cursor over there, you see how this is doing a very weird behavior. Uh, there is some bugs that we need to fix. The quality is not good enough. Uh, it happens exactly the same with the uh, separate thread. So it means, for, for instance, if you are creating your application, it can run perfectly, and you see that nothing, everything is working. So you say, hey, yeah, I, can, I, want, I want to use this in my production application. But that is not the case. Just for instance, let me just do something like this. Um, you will see how my application is crashing. So, I mean, the Functionality is there, the API is there, but R is in development. So this is a, a call out that please, yeah, making sure that, that this is not critical for you and for the preview, for the next release, which is the preview, the uh, Reunion 0.5, which is the supported version, this uh, ability of creating multi-win are not going to be there until we have the enough quality for, for that. Uh, more things, mm, yeah, I remember now. So we also introduced several new controls as Anna said before. This, I'm going to ch show you a couple of controls. One control is the uh, info bar, another one is the progress rim. For instance, let me yeah, start this up. So, which is sorting some kind of points using several uh, sorting algorithm. So you see this control over there, which is the new info bar, which uh, it has several types of severity. So it has some warning, some success, some canceling stuff. Let me just switch for this algorithm. 
star. If I cancel right now, you will see this right now is some kind of light red. Um, but we also have this progress ring over there that you can use uh, today. The progress, the progress ring have basically two steps. One step is the uh, in the terminate, another one is the terminate. In the terminate means that it's going to be spin, is, uh, spinning all the time, and the terminate is you can set up which percentage of the ring is going to be complete, and you can do that uh, uh, programmatically. Huh. I think that's all. Oh no, I remember something else. I read uh, last night that there was some questions about the the execution alias. Hey, how is it's possible to use execution alias in WinY3 in desktop? Uh, execution alias uh, allowed uh, executing a package app uh, from the command line without using the full path or, uh, or yeah, with the command line, because uh, in other case, you have to go into your menu and click the, the and click the, app, the application, and this is the only way just to can run this. But execution alias is something that allows to you, for example, to uh, listen in a common parameter from the from the uh, for, 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 uh, for your app. So yes, you can do that. Um, the way to do that is very straightforward. Yes, you have to uh, edit your package manifest, and in your package manifest, you have to specify this extension, and this extension is an execution alias. Uh, just set up the alias that you want, and then you can go to your application, and you say something like sorting, usually, uh, I say sorting win UI3, something like that, I call that. And there we are, you are running your app. This is working today. So if you are wondering about this demo and how you can get this demo, I already uh, published this demo in the GitHub that we have for the demos, WinY3 demos. So you go here in the source, and this is the demo I'm using today. So right now you can download and starting to play with that. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Just one thing, <laughs> as you see, the sorting algorithm, algorithm, they are super cool. Actually, I don't know you, but it's, it's a sort of naughty for me. I can spend a lot of time just changing between algorithm and watching all this stuff. So I want to dedicate this, uh, this demo to, to my teacher to my teacher that forced me to memorize all the sorting algorithm, algorithm when I was studying in science computer. It was painful to memorize all, all of them, but I still remember that. So, hmm. All right, Anna, I think that's all for, for me today. All right, thank you, Miguel. Wow, that was awesome. Uh I also had to memorize all of the sorting algorithms <laughs> not too long ago in school, so. <laughs> That brought back some some not so great memories, but awesome demos, uh, super cool. Everyone, please go check out uh, Miguel's demos on GitHub, play around with them. Uh, really helpful, useful stuff if you're looking to use Preview 4. Uh, so next up, we are welcoming our partner Spotlight from Esri. Uh, Morten Nielsen is the dev lead on the Esri ArcGIS runtime SDK for .NET. A lot of you might know him. He's been on uh, community calls before. Uh, he's a Microsoft MVP, and you may have seen him on Twitter as Dot Morton. Um, but Morton, why don't you go ahead and share your screen and get started with your demos? Sure. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, we have ported um, or supported WinUI with our, our runtime SDK. Um, but just to really quick go over what that really is, um, it's basically a set of APIs and controls for rendering maps and analyzing maps, uh, which pretty much support almost any UI framework that you can think of in .NET. Um, and the very latest is we just added support for WinUI 3 Preview 4. Um, just real quick, we have like all sorts of different um, features, like you can do um, routing both online and offline, um, and you can do like sort of like barriers, like these red um, things over here on the, in the lower right corner, like my, represent a wildfire or something like that and can automatically reroute. So it does a lot of uh, advanced calculation. And even with your own routing networks that, for instance, first responders might use that have sort of a different 
there's a different route calculation goes into it when you certainly can uh, go through red lights, for instance, when you have your sirens on. Um, of course, there's all sorts of advanced 3D rendering, or you can do rendering underground, do measurements. Um, there's a red and green one in the bottom here is, is for instance, it's called view shed analysis, where the driving car can, you can kind of see what it can see and not see kind of live, and that can be used for some like, for instance, tactical um, uh, scenarios where you want to know where you're visible and not, and so on. And there's also other, so a bunch of other stuff. Like in this case, here's some utility management where, for instance, you might have select a transformer and say this is out. Like which customers might be affected if you were to turn this one off. Or, or you can also do the opposite where you have a set of customers you you know are out of power, so you can then trace up and find the likely uh, uh, problem areas. So there's all sorts of these kind of scenarios, and all of that stuff works all online and offline. And typically, how we build all this, we actually build everything mostly in C++. Um, but then we put a nice little .NET shim on top. And that's sort of like a big .NET standard API that allows you to do all these sort of APIs across the platforms. And then we provide a set of packages on top for WPF and Xamarin and UWP and Xamarin Forms on top. And it sort of splits it up in, in several levels of, of SDKs. So it's pretty natural for us to just take the UWP port code and just port it to WinUI. And then we add another one to this whole section. And then then based on whether you run as a Win32 app or your P app, we'll pull in different native libraries um, automatically for that. It actually works really well. Um, and it really wasn't very much work. Um, mainly, I just do a search and replace of Windows UI SAML with Microsoft UI SAML. Um, and that's really all that takes, uh, to, or mostly take. I think probably that's 95% of the work. Um, in our case, though, because we still have to support UWP and all the other platforms, we use a preprocessor. Here's actually a, a snippet I found from one of the more the one of the more extreme ones, where we would um, basically define a WinUI conditional, and then we will include these namespaces on, on UWP, which is referenced by NetFX Core. We'd use these other ones and, and Android and iOS, and it kind of go gets a little bit crazy to write cross-platform code for all these platforms. But it actually works pretty well, and that takes care of most of our code. We did have some C++ code that was written in C++ CX, uh, and with WinUI, we had to move that to WinRT. We could have done that a while ago, but what we had was working for UWP, so it's just not broke, don't touch it. Right. Um, but we didn't make that uh, change, and that was a little bit of just getting used to the slightly different syntax, but code-wise, really not very many changes. Um, a thing we found with preview before that uh, Miguel also just mentioned was that the disp dispatcher now is actually not available anymore. You should use the dispatcher queue. Um, so there was a lot of no reference exceptions at runtime that is resolved by just changing this. Um, we, we rely on a lot of DPI changes and stuff. Again, the current view is not really valid anymore. So this we now there's a new there's a product called Samarut on each control, um, and you can get the rest of the station scale. Um, and then just for apps and stuff. All the WinUI 2 controls we're using, it's just really a matter of removing the prefix. Now they just build it, which is awesome. Um, and that is really most of the work for us to port to WinUI. Um, and so but if you want to use this, um, you can just go on nuke.org and search for SDR Actia's runtime. And you should find a bunch of packages. And right here at the bottom, you'll see WinUI um, that you can reference today. So the preview 2 is the one that works with preview 4. Um, just to make that nice and confusing. Um, but you also see like platforms for like for all the different other UI frameworks as well. Um, there's some open source components, for augmented reality. Um, we have something called hydrography, which is for kind of like you want to make uh, map, uh, maps for um, for ships and stuff like that. It has a very specific type of topography. Um, and something we have is called a local server that runs as a Win32 thing. And that's not something that was available for us for UWP, but with WinUI, because we can run it as a Win32 app, and that, that's also an, uh, able to use it. Before that, we were pretty much forced to use WPF to use our local server component. But instead of just talking about it, I thought I would just build the world's quickest demo. Um, so here, I just have Complete standard um, new template for WinUI. I just said new project, pick the WinUI desktop package tab. Um, and I'm just going to go into my project file and add a NuGet package. And I love that I can now just add it straight in my project file rather than going to the NuGet dialog. So it's just the S3 Oculus runtime WinUI. And that should resolve in just a second right here. Let's see, there we go. And then let me go and edit the main window. We'll first declare my namespace. Let's change this into a grid. 
App view, and we'll, and something that's different from if you've used a map control like the Ping Maps control, you don't really have to do much else. Um, we do require you to define a map. Also, there will be no map at all rendered, it'll just be blank. Um, so let's define a map property. Get rid of this code here. And I'll just make that a simple little getter. We'll define what we call a base map. And I really like this night base map. So you have a, a map to be, uh, contain a base map that kind of contains you like your reference, like your streets or some imagery and stuff like that. And then you put data on top to kind of visualize. Um, but that really should be it. So if I just build that real quick. Boom, boom, boom. Deploying. And here we go. So here's actually my quick little map. So this is really how easy it is to get an app in here. Um, I might want to have something more interesting so I can start adding different layers to my map. Um, I could also go, for instance, here, we have like a bunch of different data already. Here's our coronavirus data, which I thought was interesting. Um, and there's, for instance, a map here about the current trend. So what I can really do is just take this link and I'm just going to copy that. And instead of defining this, I'm just going to define a URL that points to that. I'm going to run the app again. And now what it's going to do is actually go on and reference the map that uh, comes from an online resource and manage there. So if I ever wanted to modify my app, my, my map, I don't have to actually um, go and update my app. I can just manage the app independently. And so here I get the exact same app map just instantly uh, updated from that. So I can manage and update data in the cloud and just automatically pull it in here, which makes it really easy to manage my data. If I do want to do 3D, um, I could take my map and we'll just call that a scene. So I'll just change all of this to scene. I'll put this in the second column. And let's use this awesome new, what's it called? Column definitions. This was added in preview three. I just realized that yesterday. You can now just define your columns like this, which is awesome. It's much simpler. And then a scene might require a little more. Um, I'm going to define a predefined scene here um, with the location I want to start up in. Let me just resolve these. Um, I'm going to add a world elevation because now I want 3D. I want um, like different types of um, elevation data in here that shows mountains and so on. And I can use my own custom data. And something that because I'm now running as a Win32 app, I can just reference some data directly here. Here's actually a half a gigabyte of buildings um, that I can load straight from disk. And so let's try that. Quick. So here I have my app side by side. So here I'm running in 3D with my buildings of uh, this is downtown San Diego, uh, the baseball stadium. Um, but you get that whole smooth, cool 3D globe that you can work with. So you can add your own data here. You can have local data. I used my drone to collect some building data recently that I can just pull straight in, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is a good way to get started. Um, if you do want um, if you do want to learn some more, you can go to our samples repo. And if you go to the source folder, Win UI, there's a whole sample app here you can you can uh, download and run. And I'm going to pull that up real quick, and it would look like this. And this is all running as Win32, and you can kind of browse and you can search for for samples. Maybe I want to look at something how to extrude data. Um, so here's an example of that. You can pull, see the description of it, how that works. You can see all the source code, how to build an app like this. And so there's lots and lots of different little samples that you can go and browse and then learn how to do certain things. Um, this is a good way to get to learn how to actually um, use the different APIs for all the different things. Um, just going to switch back. So just to wrap up, really, you just have to get the WinUI package. Um, you can read a lot of our documentation from the Arceus, developers arceus.com slash net, net for .net. Um, there's not really a whole lot of WinUI information there yet, but almost pretty much since the APIs are identical for WPF and WinUI and UWP and Xamarin, that the APIs are almost identical. So you can pretty much use that code um, 
here's the link to the sample app I was just showing you there. That's a good starting point to kind of learn how to use it. Um, and there's the ability to get a free license string. You might say my app had a little uh, watermark in the corner that says there's license developer use, but if you get a license string, that kind of goes away. It's sort of similar to how you would do with Bing Maps. You also have to provide a key there. Um, another way you can do right now is just go to the Microsoft Store and you can actually search for ArcGIS Rundrum SDK for .NET samples and you can get the WPF version of this. And again, most of the samples are identical except might be slightly different fl flavor in the XAML. Um, uh, or you can, again, of course, just get the source code for the WinUI on the GitHub repo. Um, and that is pretty much my demo for that. All right. Thank you so much. That is just so cool. I mean, every time I see the Esri, the ArcGIS demos, it is so cool. Thank you for showing that off. Um, it's awesome that you're able to put that on Preview 4. I also recommend checking out, you know, their sample app on GitHub, as Morton recommended. Um, just really cool stuff to see how far you can bring, you know, your app with WinUI. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. right. uh, We're really happy with the performance we get from uh, the swap chain panel, especially over WPF, where it is much harder to get a really great DirectX performance, like with WinUI or even with UWP for that matter. Um, just gives us like really smooth, uh, nice rendering performance. So it's it's we're really happy with it. Awesome. That's so great to mm -hmm. hear. Yeah, so thank you so much, Morton, for joining us and for showing that off. And Morton will be around for Q&A if you guys have any mm -hmm. questions for him. Uh, switching back to our PowerPoint, uh, now it is time for Savoy. He has a section. Let me share my PowerPoint to our Teams call so we're all on the same page here. Um, but Savoy, whenever you're ready, take it away. Uh, sure thing. Am I coming through, Anna? Yep. All right, sweet. I've uh, got a bit of content here, but I'll try and get through it quickly so we can leave plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, hi, everyone. Like Anna said, I'm Savoy. Uh, I'm a program manager on the WinUI team, and over the last year or so, I've been helping drive a lot of customer development and customer research for, with, uh, for WinUI. Lately, I've also been working with Anna and other members of the team to figure out how we can continue to improve our general engagement and feedback pipelines uh, and I thought it would be valuable to you as a community to also take some time to share with you some best practices and strategizing uh, strategies for maximizing your influence through feedback. Uh, before I dive into this, uh, I do want to be very clear in saying that the team fully understands and agrees that all feedback, ideas, and sources of frustration are valid coming from you as our community and our customers. Uh, regardless of how things get praised or the level of detail it includes, the team always, always, always takes your feedback seriously, considers it, and discusses it when formulating our priorities and invest, uh, investments within WinUI. So when I say this, please also understand that prioritization and transparency are super complex topics, especially when the team is balancing your feedback with private internal and external partnerships that we may not be able to be publicly transparent about at the time. So please trust that your feedback is heard by the team and is deeply considered even if we aren't able to respond to it or act on it immediately. Uh, now with that little disclaimer out of the way, I do want to focus on best practices that will help you maximize your influence on WinUI. Uh, and Anna, I'm not quite sure how I can tell which slide you're on uh, since the stream on YouTube is a little behind, but uh, I'll, I'll go to the first slide here, uh, which should be titled uh, Phrasing Positively. Uh, uh, Savoy, can you so see my PowerPoint in the Teams call? I actually can. Oh, now I can. Sorry. Okay, I think my great. Teams just was being weird there for a moment. No Sweet. problem. We are, we're good. Um, so, uh, let's see, where was I? Um, yeah. Yeah, so noting the complexity of prioritization and future planning, the thing uh, that can most dramatically improve the influence of your feedback is focusing on positive phrasing uh, with constructive calls to action. Especially when experiencing a pain point, it can be supernatural to focus on the negatives and resolving things from the perspective of the negative. Uh, the issue here is that telling the team what you want us to prevent is often a lot less clear and a lot less actionable than telling us specifically what you want us to do uh, specifically what you want us to help you achieve. By focusing on positive phrasing and what needs to be achieved, uh, it stands to be more clear uh, in informing the team of exactly what are the most tactical investments we can make to move you forward in the most meaningful and impactful ways for you as a customer and in respect to your goals. Uh, consider reflecting for a moment on 
both kinds of these feedback that you might have personally received in the past. Which felt more clear and conquerable? Uh, what seemed to move things forward more? Uh, perhaps even because of a constructive outcome-focused partner that you could continue to collaborate and engage with. I would expect even brief reflection here will help crystallize how significantly more effective and clearly actionable positively phrased feedback can be. Uh, looking to further this, it's imperative that your constructive calls to action on the team be clear and detailed, especially on the why, so that we can make sure that whatever it is we arrive at together appropriately focuses on your goal and your intended outcome from start to finish. Some crucial but often overlooked details include things like being clear on what's the main benefit to you, uh, you might think it seems obvious and doesn't require explanation, but I'm convinced if you follow this practice, you'll be quickly surprised at how being very specific about what it is you value in terms of outcome, not just in terms of technical capability, uh, can often help us as a team engineer more effective and innovative solutions that better cater to your needs. Another thing is being clear on the alternative, whatever that is. Is it a workaround, a different platform or framework, uh, stagnation for you and your product? Helping us understand what you currently have uh, jumpstarts our, uh, our solution by leveraging the known alternatives, and in the worst case scenarios, helps us prioritize appropriately by ensuring we understand how critically you're set back by the absence of a capability. The last sub bullet here is uh, comparisons to other solutions, platforms, and frameworks can be helpful as a complement to your explanation, but please don't ever assume it replaces the need for an explanation. Even if you think it seems obvious, I'll remind you that you are an incredibly unique professional with an equally unique diversity of experience, perspectives, skills, values, et cetera. And it shouldn't be assumed that we'll perfectly understand what it is about a comparative product that matters the most to you without you bringing us along for the journey in understanding what we need to do to cater to you as an important customer to the team. Uh, so to sum this all up so far, understanding clearly and concisely what needs to be done to support you as a customer moves us forward faster and with an actionable plan and goal that we can continue to collaborate on with you and ensure when UI truly works for you. Uh, last, I want to touch on the importance of mutual empathy. I'll call back to the start of this section in saying that when you share your pain points and frustration with us, we listen and consider it deeply. Uh, we're people too who care about helping you and moving you forward. In return, please understand that the team members on the opposite side of the keyboards are trying their best to do their job in helping you, in addition to juggling their commitments to numerous other customers, contributors, and partnerships. Uh, so approaching the situation with mutual empathy and a mindset that you are two mutually invested professionals trying to help each other get the job done will ultimately improve your collaborative relationships all around. Uh, Anna, we can jump to the next slide here. Uh, I've All talked right. a lot so far, so I'm going to try and wrap it up quickly by showing one super simplified example of putting this into practice and one example of real influence that's uh, resulted for the team. So looking at this here, I've created a generic example of feedback that is valuable to the team, but nonetheless could be improved to help this customer get the most out of their time spent engaging with us. Uh, the before reads, the state of the platform is disappointing. I'm not going to consider WinUI until my trust has been earned. Uh, Looking at the after, we can see that taking some extra time to be really clear about what it is that the team needs to do to resolve this issue gives us super clear and actionable feedback to act on. Uh, the, uh, the first bullet here is reinforcement of an investment we are currently making. It's imperative to know that we're on track to meet your needs uh, and so that this work doesn't get reprioritized differently. The second and third items are things we have yet to do but are straightforward enough and give us an approximate timeline we'd need to deliver it in to help keep this customer on track. And we can jump to the next slide, Anna. Uh, right. To look at an example of where this approach has resulted in real influence, uh, back when the team was first moving WinUI 2 to open source, I had the task of piloting our first open uh, source spec for teaching tip. I went over to our spec repo, I started a new doc, and began writing it there, live and in the open, over the course of a few weeks. There were several helpful community members who gave me really clear feedback that the time they spent reviewing the doc and trying to help me identify issues and gaps, um, uh, when they realized that those issues and gaps only existed because I hadn't gotten to them yet and they were known and on my to-do list the whole time. The feedback they gave said, please don't post a new spec until the first draft is really actually complete. That way we can know that your first pass is done and use our time in ways that are you know, uniquely meaningful helping to spot actual gaps and issues, not just things you hadn't gotten to yet. Uh, and that's exactly what the team did moving forward. 
by focusing on positive phrasing, constructive action and outcomes, being detailed and clear and approaching the situation with mutual empathy, there was zero friction from the team to act on this feedback immediately and our open source collaboration with you as a community improved because of it. This is just a simple example, but I wanted to share to show how following these best practices can maximize your influence on several aspects of WinUI and help to shape this product, our process and our culture to truly work for you. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to help laser focus us on some opportunities for the community to get involved in giving feedback that helps shape WinUI. Awesome, thanks Savoy. And I just want to reiterate what Savoy had to say. Hey, um, Ryan. Ryan, your mic is super robotic. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe okay. uh, use your computer mic instead of your headphones. Just let me quickly rejoin the call, one sec. Okay. Well, hopefully Ryan comes back with <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. I feel like I should have some music to play while we figure out technical issues on this call. Maybe <laughs> next time. <laughs> it's probably still dealing with the snow. True. So, well, while we wait for Ryan, I'm going to jump into the comment section here on YouTube and make sure that we're getting these questions captured so that we can move through Q&A super quickly. Hey, Savoy, I'm back if uh, if you can hear me. Sweet. You sound great, Ryan. We're ready for you. OK, I, uh, I had to I was trying to go um, uh, earphones off or whatever, headphones off. But uh, this old trusty uh, mic on this headphone, I guess I can't get away from it. So. Um, yeah, I want to reiterate to everyone uh, what Savoy said earlier. You know, your feedback is extremely valuable to us. And um, and so uh, I want to give you some examples of the types of feedback that, you know, is likely to shape the product and then type and then some examples of feedback that probably won't shape it, at least in the short term. Um, and the main reason I want to do this is just to make sure that you don't feel like you're wasting your time providing feedback and that you also get a sense of where the team is oriented and what we're, you know, most sensitively listening to. So I wrote a few examples down here um, on this uh, on this on the slide that you see here, you know, it's really valuable to us, and it really does shape what we focus on when you give us um, feedback uh, on, you know, features that you care about for your app. And and the important thing too to add here is um, that you talk about your app as well when you give that feedback. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, please work on unpackaged support. It's another one to tell us a little bit about. Um, how unpackaged support would help you in your specific circumstance. That really gives us a sense, not only of what feature matters to you, but how we could shape the solution of that feature in your direction. Um, any feedback that you have on ways to improve, um, you know, community engagement and interaction, we're always listening to that, always love to hear it. We wanna make sure that you really feel connected to what's happening in WinUI, and then also that you, you know, always feel that your voice is being heard as well. So feedback along that, along those lines is really valuable. Um, stories about how our roadmap plans do or maybe don't enable your apps uh, are really great. Um, it just helps us to make sure that we have the right bearing on, on where we're investing. Ways that we can improve the developer experience, including uh, tooling improvements we can make. It's really great to see feedback on that. I sometimes see feedback around VS Code or um, other things that we can do in Visual Studio. Um, that's that's really useful feedback for us to internalize as a team. Um, but also, you know, ways that we can improve our docs and blogs. That's really valuable. And of course, the most obvious one, and maybe the most the the best way that you can help shape the product is just um, finding bugs and issues. Um, if you find them, please reach out to us and file them. I would say that uh, we internally right now are sort of having a dialogue on our team about how we can absorb the volume of bugs and issues that are coming in and make sure that we're responsive and that we don't have longstanding issues on the repo, which I think is a problem that we suffer from right now. So that, um, that's the dialogue that we're discussing on how we can be better there. But please keep those coming in because they, they really do help us know sort of what problems are there. You can advance, Anna. And then last, um, you, you know, there's sometimes feedback that we get that is less likely to shape the product. It's not that it's bad feedback. It's just it's not where the team is sort of oriented right now. So, um, you know, feedback on products beyond WinUI is an obvious one. You know, you guys should start doing X with the start menu. We often get feedback like that. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's just it's not a WinUI thing. And so understanding that we're really focused on trying to make beautiful native 
um, engaging user experiences and client apps for Windows. That's what we're really about. Um, and so feedback um, in in uh, you know to to us uh, on the WinUI product is really great. And 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 if it's not about WinUI, then it usually um, you know is a waste of your time in providing us th that feedback. And um, and uh, I'll move on to the next bullet, I guess. So stop doing X and start doing Y. So there is some good uh, goodness in this type of feedback, but. Usually there's a really good reason why we're doing X and we're going to do X anyway. Um, so even, you know, it could be that we're partnering with somebody. It could be that we have our own needs and our own Windows apps. And so if we're already working on something or we've sort of committed to do a feature, we're probably going to continue to do it and we probably won't stop it. Um, start doing Y is useful because it tells us what features you care about. But the uh, issue with that is it doesn't really give us any context. You know, if somebody says, please go and give us Rust support. Um, that that's great, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your your situation. Like I was saying before, so that we can understand why you want it, why you care about it, why it's important to you in your in your circumstance. And finally, um, any feedback around like cross plat or reaching beyond Windows is just not something where the team is is oriented right now. We're very much focused on making really great Windows experiences. There are great solutions for going cross platform. Um, the you know, for example, the uh, the Uno team very faithfully attends every one of these calls and is on this call. Um, Uno is a great solution that helps you uh, to take WinUI to other platforms. You can look into that. Um, there is React Native for Windows. There's Maui. There's lots of different products, both both uh, made by Microsoft and made by the great ecosystem that surrounds Microsoft um, um, to, to go and reach there. But our team is not as focused in, in that direction. So um, we'll be putting out... Um, uh, guidance on both what Savoy had mentioned about how we can just really um, maintain a really healthy culture of feedback um, and also what types of feedback are valuable versus less valuable. We'll have guidance on that coming out soon. Thanks very much. All right. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for um, presenting that. I think that's really good information. Um, let's move right along to Q&A as um, yes. <laughs> it's a short time period. Okay. Yeah. So I'm ready to jump right into it. Uh, Anna, do you have us in together mode? Uh, I will put you in, but feel free to get started. Sweet. And uh, to all of our presenters and guests, feel welcome to join me with your cameras on, uh, and we'll dive right in. Uh, we don't have Dot Morton here every day, so Morton, if you're ready for some questions, I'd love to throw a couple your way. And if you're there, Morton, you might be muted. I I've not heard I'm, I'm here. Okay, sweet, sweet. Uh, so, I just have a leaf um, blower outside, so, so I'm trying to stay quiet when I can. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so John is asking, uh, is the map drawn using a swap chain panel? Yes, we're using swap chain panel to do the rendering uh, with DirectX rendering, DirectX 11 rendering under there, yeah. Um, that works actually really awesome for us. On that subject of rendering, we actually had another question on that precisely, uh, where someone said, "Great, uh, cool demo. What is the rendering technology you are using on Swap Chain? DirectX, Angle, OpenGL?" Question mark. Yeah, so that's DirectX for for WinUI. Um, we do use um, OpenGL for Android. We use Metal for iOS, but on Windows, it's DirectX all the way through. Awesome. And last, uh, Lance here is asking if you can share the link again to the GitHub repo with the demo. Yep, I think I already posted that in the chat. Um, do I need to share it here? Um, either way, if you, uh, I wasn't watching the presentation uh, deck earlier, but if it's in the slides, I'm sure they can rewind yeah. and catch it as it's well. It's in the slides, yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see, who else should we grab here? Uh, Miguel. We don't have Miguel every day either. Uh, Miguel, Martin Anderson is asking, can you recolor the window control buttons? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Actually, in the in the demo that I show you today, uh, there is uh, in the application uh, .saml file there there are some styles uh, there that people can overwrite and change the color. But you change the color of the all the window or your app. It's not per window. Changing the color per window is something that is not available yet. yet. But if you want to change all the colors or all the window in your app, you can change these styles. Awesome. And we had another question from two uh, viewers, actually, who were asking, are the minimize, maximize, and close buttons smaller than the standard ones? Also, can you reposition the min-max close buttons? 
you cannot reposition that and the side of the the side of the buttons are the latest uh, recommendation for our design team so if they are minimum is because this is the way that people think is the way that to do it awesome all right uh, Anna, a question for you. Martin is asking, previously the advice was not to nest navigation view controls within another navigation view. Now is that advice different if pivots are supposed to be replaced with top-oriented navigation views? Right. So I, um, I doubt that the guidance is going to change on using a navigation view within a navigation view. Um, one thing to definitely look at is the hierarchical navigation view uh, feature that was released in WinUI 2.4. Um, this is a great question to also ask on our repo just to get kind of 100% confirmed, but I do not believe that we're gonna change the guidance about that. Gotcha. And another question for you, Anna, from Wim, who's asking, uh, the scroll header control is removed from the Windows Community Toolkit's latest preview. What's the alternative here and is it documented somewhere? Right, so actually I spoke with Michael Hawker, uh, the maintainer of the Windows Community Toolkit to get an answer for this question. Um, so all this control was doing was adding a behavior. Uh, so I believe in the 7.0 release, the Windows Community Toolkit, uh, all you have to do now is add the behavior itself. So the control has basically just been refactored in that way. And if you just add that behavior, it should work as before. Awesome. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan, I'll try throwing this your way. Roblu is asking, is V0.8 only planned to be a bug fix for V0.5? It's not clear from the roadmap what features are changing. Yeah, there isn't much changing. It is mostly um, a bug fix. Um, we're, we're, we're going to be trying to um, expand out sort of the stability a little bit more between 0.5 and 0 0.8. 0 0.5 will still be good and stable for the features that it ships. But we know that there are some sort of edge cases that will need to be cleaned up. And so that's why we want to quickly turn around a point eight as well. You can build production apps on either one. Um, there might be one or two new, like smaller features that just like don't elevate to the point where we wanted to say something on the roadmap, but it'll be most of the, mostly fixes. Awesome. Uh, Morton, another question for you. Uh, is there something WinUI versions of ArcGIS can do that the UWP versions can't? Well, yes and no. So the APIs are pretty much the same. Um, but I think one, one thing I showed was the way I just access data straight off uh, um, uh, any any folder on my, my system. So when I'm in Sandbox, that that's that's not necessarily possible. Um, so one of, one of the issues we have there is we would have to rewrite all our third-party libraries to to use those uh, other file APIs that can go through the broker, and, and that's really just not feasible. Um, for us to do so, being able to read straight out like files straight up, especially for these, sometimes there's gigabytes of data, and, and the alternative so far you'll be has to be take the file, copy it inside the sandbox, and then use them from there. So being able to now run those straight up um, and as a Win32 app um, is, is pretty huge for us. Um, and I also mentioned we have this local server component that runs a whole service that you can work with that adds a lot of extra capabilities. So that too is like. The, being able to get out of the sandbox, I think, opens up a lot of scenarios for our customers. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw a question to Mike uh, and or Steve here. Uh, never sure which one to route to, uh, which of you. Uh, Barack is asking, windows.current.setTitleBar uh, was introduced for WinUI Desktop in Preview 4, but is still not implemented in WinUI UWP. Are there any plans to show uh, some WinUI love for UWP 2 in the near future? Uh, like the team seems mostly focused on providing more APIs for desktop uh, and only focused on new runtime and build options for UWP. I can talk about that a little bit. Uh, custom title bar support is, and UWP is, uh, it's not a WinUI feature, it's a general feature. Um, there's a application view title bar API that should still work with WinUI 3 on UWP. So what we have done for WinUI 3 for desktop apps is add same support, um, and then it's exposed in the XAML window API. And then the plan is that, well, uh, I don't think we've got that working yet in the UWP app, but the plan is that we'll make that same API work in both cases. It's just in the desktop case, it'll be 
routing to uh, H1N, and in the UWP case, it'll be routing to an application view title bar. Um, there's also some discussion, a uh, bunch of discussion in the project reunion repo about window uh, and how windows work going forward for desktop and UWP. If you look in the project reunion repo for just search for app window, there's some discussion there about uh, generalizing it across the two. Awesome. And we're right at time here, so I'll end with one last question for our spotlight guest. And I will say we ran short on Q&A uh, this time. Uh, apologies, but thank you everyone who asked questions. Uh, we'll make sure to save these for next month's call and feel free to file them as questions or discussion topics on our repo to help see them uh, answered, especially if they're larger, more complex topics. So closing question, uh, Morton, uh, how much effort was it to port the sample viewer application? Uh, I think I had it compiling within an hour and then I spent a few hours just kind of going through bugs and finding most of the main things. Um, so like the the search replace that I showed in my slide was did almost most of it fixed the compiler errors and I was pretty much there. Um, I think preview four added a little extra things like we were relying on a lot of dispatchers and a few window things that I had to get rid of, but it wasn't that bad. I think the biggest thing is I moved from a sandbox app and I changed it to be a package Win thirty two app and that um, there was definitely some some file reading APIs that we that I had to change a little bit or how I deploy things. That was probably the most work. But it, it wasn't really terrible, and it, there's a lot of code in those sample apps. There's a lot of samples in there, and it really wasn't terrible. Um, you can actually take the UWP folder and the uh, WinUI folder on, on GitHub, and you can compare them and kind of get a feel for where the changes are. Most of them will be just be the namespaces. Awesome. Thanks a ton, Morton. Um, and again, everyone, uh, I see there's some comments coming in. If we didn't get to your question, super sorry our time was short this month, but uh, we'll be back again next month. We'll save the questions, and if anything's a hot issue for you, file it on our repo so that we can see it handled. I'll turn it back to Anna to close us out. All right, thanks, Savoy. And as he said, we save all the questions um, for the next call, so rest assured, hopefully we can get to your question next time around. Uh, sorry for the, the short Q&A there, but thanks everyone for watching, staying over a couple extra minutes. Uh, we really appreciate it. We will see you next month on March 17th. But once again, in the meantime, feel free to always uh, keep up with us and interact with us on GitHub and Twitter. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.